the uh, the the recent no the latest uh, amendment in our tax code of 1997 or in Republic Act 8424. So the National Internal Revenue Code, which uh, we commonly call as the Tax Code of 1997, that is Republic Act 8424, uh, it underwent several major revisions in the last three or five years. Okay? And, and this afternoon, we will be discussing the most recent one. Two months ago lang ito, na napirmahan bilang bagong batas, and we call it as the uh, Create Law, or the corporate recovery and tax incentive act for enterprise uh, tax incentives for enterprises act or republic act number 11534 uh, okay so dito let's let's have a general framework of the tax reform program of the government uh, that is being implemented or sought to be implemented during the the present administration okay so here is the comprehensive tax reform program of the Department of Finance. Okay, the, the, the tax reform program of the present administration is composed of six packages. So package one, you have the train law. Package 1B, that is the tax amnesty. Package two, the trabajo bill. Package two plus the universal health care, package three, the property valuation and taxes, and package four, uh, capital income and financial taxes. Okay, so where are we now? Currently, where are we or where is the present administration in its tax reform program? Okay, so the, the present administration is 50% done already on its tax reform program. We already have package one. We already have package 1B and just recently package 2. Okay, so what is this package 1, the train law? Okay, this is uh, Republic Act number 10963 or the tax reform for acceleration and inclusion law. Okay, the tax reform for acceleration and inclusion law. Okay, uh, so this is one, this is the major amendment in the National Internal Revenue Code of 1997. If you will recall, no? If you will recall, uh, the National Internal Revenue Code or Republic Act Number 84, uh, 24 took effect January 1, 1998. Okay, it took effect January 1, 1998, and 20 years after, okay, on January 1, 2018, the train law took effect. Okay. It was signed into law on December 19, 2017 by the president, but became effective January 1, 2018. But there are other provisions in the train law which have a different effectivity dates. Okay, it, it, for example, there is a provision on VAT that na take effect siya January 1, uh, 2019. Okay, and some provisions of the train law were vetoed by the president. Five provisions to be exact. So what are the key amendments of the train law? Okay. What are the key amendments of the train law? First, it lowers the personal income tax. If you will recall, no, yung ating section 24A of the tax code pertaining to uh, citizen and residents of the Philippines, no? we are using a graduated rate for to determine the income tax liability of citizens and residents in the Philippines, right? And what is this graduated rate? Under the tax code of 1997, that is a rate of 0% up to 30, uh, that is a rate of 5% up to 32%, okay? But under the train law, if you will recall, under the train law, not all Okay, individual or income earners are subject to these graduated rates. It would now depend on your classification. It will now depend on your classification as a personal income earners. Are you a, a, a purely compensation income earner? Are you a self-employed individual? Or a, are you a mixed income earner? Okay. If you are a purely compensation income earner, Meaning to say, your only source of income is compensation arising from employer-employee relationship, then your taxable income will be subject to the new graduated rate of 0 to 35%. 
with the first 250,000 taxable income as not subject to income tax or exempt. Yung first 250,000 taxable income. Mo. That is if you are a purely compensation income earner. Who again is the purely compensation income earner? Okay, an individual who derives income, who derives uh, income out of compensation from services rendered under the employer-employee relationship. So that is the important element, no? the presence of the employer-employee relationship. And wala ka ng ibang source of income, kundi ang pagiging empleyado mo. Uh, the second classification is a self-employed individual. If you will recall, a self-employed individual, ito yung mga engaged in business or practice of a profession or mga professionals na tinatawag natin like basketball player, professional boxers, etc., etc. Those who, who use sports, arts, uh, not as a habit but a source of a livelihood. Kung naalala natin, under the train law, ang self-employed individual ay aalamin natin kung ano ang kanyang gross sales or gross receipts and other non-operating income. Titingnan natin yung threshold. Lumampas ka ba ng 3 million or hindi uh, lumampas ng 3 million? Okay? Not exceeding 3 million or exceeding 3 million. Okay? If the gross receipts or gross sales and other non-operating income of a self-employed individual does not exceed 3 million, meron siyang option. That self-employed individual has the option to be taxed at 8% of the gross sales or receipts and other non-operating income in excess of 250,000. Naalala yon the 8% income tax which must be uh, in excess of 250,000 on gross receipts and gross sales mo. Or you can be taxed at the graduated rate. Okay? You can be taxed at the graduated rate. Remember, ha? the option is available if the gross receipts and sales and other non-operating income of the self-employed or professional does not exceed 3 million. Okay? Does not exceed 3 million. Because kapag lumampas ka ng 3 million, pag lumampas ng 3 million, ang gross sales or receipts and other non-operating income ng self-employed individual, automatically, graduated rate ang mag apply sa iyo. Automatically, graduated rate ang mag apply sa iyo. Again, the option is only available if the gross receipts and sales and other non-operating income does not exceed, okay, the total does not exceed 3 million. Okay? Papaano naman itong mga mixed income earner? Who are these mixed income earners? Okay? Sila yung mga may income na under the employer-employer relationship and at the same time, may own business or engage in the practice of a profession. In short, a combination of a purely compensation income earner and self-employed individual. Okay? If you are a mixed income earner, we have to group your income into compensation income and business income. Your compensation income will be automatically subject to graduated rate. Ano nga ulit yung graduated rate natin? Ito, the new 0 to 35% rate. Papaano naman yung business income mo? Again, titingnan mo, lumampas ka ba ng 3 million or hindi ka lumampas ng 3 million? Okay? Pag hindi ka lumampas, if the gross sales, receipts, and other operating income okay, do not exceed, the total does not exceed 3 million, again, you have an option. Okay? You can be taxed at 8% of the gross receipts or your gross sales and other non-operating income. Okay? Pag lumampas ka naman, or, or the second option is to be taxed at the graduated rate. Okay? Kung mapapansin nyo, class, kung mapapansin nyo, ang option natin ay available lamang kapag hindi lumalampas ng 3 million. Tingnan nyo, sa mixed income earner, may option ka pa rin pag hindi ka lumampas ng 3 million. Dito sa self-employed individual, you have the option to be taxed at 8% or graduated rate kapag hindi ka lumampas ng 3 million. Pero ano ang pagkakaiba ng dalawang ito? 
Ano ang pagkakaiba ng option ng self-employed individual at ang option ng mixed income earner? Okay? Dito, sa self-employed individual, the 8% is in excess of 250,000. Pero ang 8% ng mixed income earner ay not in excess of 250,000. Okay? This is not in excess of 250,000. Why? Because the 250,000 tax exemption can only be availed once. Isang beses mo lang yan maa-avail. Yung exemption of 250,000. When your compensation income is subjected to graduated rate, the 250,000 exemption is already availed in this income. So yung business income mo, hindi na siya magiging in excess of 250,000, yung 8%. Ulitin lang natin ha. Okay? Uh, kapag hindi lumampas ng 3 million ang iyong business income, you have the option to be taxed at 8%. Kaya nga lang, magkaiba ang option na 8% kapag ikaw ay self-employed kumpara kung ang 8% doon sa mixed income earner. Ano ang pagkakaiba nila? The 8% income tax of a self-employed individual is in excess. Okay? Or the gross sales or receipts in excess of 200 50,000 while the 8% of the mixed income earner is not in excess of the 250,000. Okay? Now, the, the next uh, key amendment under the train law is the simplification of the estate and donor tax. You will recall before under section 85, under section 84 of the tax code, no, ang ating estate tax is graduated. No? Di ba graduated ang rate natin sa estate tax? Okay? This is a rate of 5% up to 20%. But now, under the train law, a flat rate of 6% of the net taxable estate will apply. Ganoon din ang donor's tax. No? Before, before the train law, if we are going to compute the donor's tax liability, ano ang gagawin natin? We need to know who the donee is. Is the donee a relative or is the donee a stranger? If the donee is a relative, the schedular rate of 2% to 15% will apply. But if the donee is a stranger, a flat rate of 10% on the net gift will apply. But under the train law, okay, regardless of who the donee is, whether the donee is a relative or a stranger, a flat rate of 6% will apply on the net gift in excess of 250,000. Okay? Ang estate tax at ang donor's tax ngayon ay pareho ng 6%. Pero ang pagkakaiba nila, pag donor's tax ang pinag-uusapan natin, the 6% will apply on the net gift in excess of 250,000. Walang ganong in excess of 250,000 kung estate tax ang pinag-uusapan natin. Okay? So dito ngayon sa train law, it doesn't matter na ha? hindi na mahalaga kung sino ang donee. Okay? A flat rate of 6%. But prior to train law under Republic of 8424, okay, aalamin mo kung sino ang donee. Kung ang donee ba ay stranger o kaya ay relative. Uh, the train law also expanded the value-added tax base. May mga transactions tayo before na either uh, zero-rated o kaya ay exempt, pero ngayon ay subject na sa value-added tax. Or from uh, <coughs> zero-rated, ngayon ay exempt na. Exempt na lang sa value-added tax. Example, yung uh, sale of gold to Banko Central ng Pilipinas under Section 106, okay? uh, letter A, number 2, Number one, small letter B, uh, uh, small letter C. Ang sale of gold sa Banko Central ay, uh, small letter D, ang sale of gold sa Banko Central ay dating zero rated. But now, under the train law, inilipat na siya. From section 106, nilipat na siya papuntang section 109. At ano yung nasa section 109? A list of exempt transaction. A list of VAT exempt transaction. So, sale of gold to Banko Central is now exempted na lamang sa value added tax. Okay? Meron tayong mga medicines na sub, na ngayon ay exempted na sa value added tax under the train law like hyper uh, medicine and drugs 
for uh, hypertension, diabetes, and high cholesterol, effective January 1, 2019, no? But under the CREATE law, dinagdagan pa itong mga mga VAT exempt na ito. Ano pa yung mga VAT exempt natin? Mga additional VAT exempt transactions under the trade law bukod sa sale of gold to Banko Sentral ng Pilipinas. You have the sale of goods and services to senior citizens and the persons with disability. Though class, no, I have to say this, na dati na namang exempted sa VAT ang sale of uh, goods and services sa senior citizen and sa mga persons with disability under their respective law. Under the Expanded Senior Citizens Act, exempted na yan ang mga purchases ng goods and services ng mga senior citizen. And under the Magna Carta for Persons with Disability, okay, exempted na rin yan ang purchases nila sa value-added tax. But ngayon, kinodify na, isinama doon sa Section 109 of the Tax Code. Another one, uh, association dues, membership fees in homeowners association and uh, condominium corporation, but exempt din yan. And uh, yun nga, yung binanggit ko kanina, yung uh, sale of drugs and medicine for high cholesterol, diabetes, and uh, hypertension. And the last one is uh, tax-free exchange or uh, properties under Section 40C2 of the tax code. So yung ating mga tax-free exchange arising from uh, reorganization ng mga companies or if you are a party to a merger or acquisition, exempted na rin yan sa value-added tax. So yun ang lima na exempt sa value-added tax na inintroduce ng train law. But under the CREATE law, may mga dinagdag pa na mga exempted sa value-added tax. Okay? The fourth amendment of the train law is the increase in excise tax of petroleum products. Kaya noong 2018, you will recall, no, January 1, 2018, nag-take effect ang train law. Okay? So noong 2018, naka-experience tayo ng pagtaas ng presyo sa mga petroleum products. Pero hindi, hindi abrupt yung, yung pagtaas ng presyo nila. No? Kasi nung first part naman ng 2018, ang ibinebentang petroleum products pa noon ay yung mga old stock pa nila. Okay, na hindi pa applicable ang new excise tax for petroleum. It also adjusted the excise tax for automobiles and the, the train law introduced uh, two new uh, taxes. No? The excise tax on sugar-sweetened beverages and excise tax on non-essential services or cosmetic procedures. So kung magpaparitoke ka, magpapainhance ka ng katawan mo, okay, or ng bodily features mo na, na, na hindi naman necessarily will improve your bodily functions, no? that will be subject to excise tax on non-essential services. When you say uh, uh, essentials, more on aesthetics. Ang pinuto, pinapatangos yung ilong, pinapadagdag ng dibdib, nagpapadagdag ng, ng, ng bat, no? So, hindi naman niya nag increase ng bodily functions ng, ng isang tao. Kaya tawag dyan, non-essential uh, services, no? Ay, hindi naman ibig sabihin na kapag ikaw ay nagpatangos ng ilong, ay lilinaw ang iyong mata. ba diba? So, kaya hindi ganun. Pero yung mga operation surgeries na, uh, you know, to, uh, na may kinalaman sa mga deformity, mga congenital deformity, or arising from accident, yan. Mga essential uh, procedures yan, essential cosmetics, o kaya ay uh, yung nasunugan, okay, nasunugan, yung balat, nasunog, okay, so kailangang operahan para maibalik yung dati niyang balat, okay, or maayos yung kanyang mukha na na-deform, yan, essential services yon hindi yan subject sa excise tax on uh, cosmetic uh, procedures, okay. So again, ha, these are the key amendments of the train law, okay. So, what about package 1B? The package 1B or the tax amnesty. At present, okay, meron na tayong uh, ongoing na tax amnesty. We have Republic Act number 11213 or the Tax Amnesty Act of 2019. It was signed into law February 14, uh, 2019. But uh, it originally it originally covered 3 tax amnesties no ito yung una estate tax amnesty number 2 the tax amnesty on delinquencies and number 3 the general uh, tax amnesty however class no itong general tax amnesty it was vetoed by the president no it was vetoed by the president so we only have two okay ongoing tax amnesties the estate tax amnesty and the tax amnesty on delinquencies. Okay? 
general principle, what do you mean by tax amnesty? Okay? What do you mean by tax amnesty? Tax amnesty means the general pardon or the intentional overlooking of the state of your tax liability. Pinapatawad ng Estado ang iyong mga tax liability or pagbabayarin ka na lamang ng mas maliit okay? na buwis. Okay? That is the general pardon or the intentional overlooking by the state of your tax liabilities. And tax amnesty works retroactively. Okay? It works retroactively and it covers civil, criminal, and administrative aspect of taxation. It is as if, if you availed the tax amnesty. It is a clean slate, a fresh start para sa iyo. Okay? Yung utang mo dati sa gobyerno na buwis na hindi mo nababayaran matagal ng panahon, nag-pile up na ang interest and penalties mo, okay? ngayon babayaran mo na okay? uh, ng mas maliit okay? ng mas maliit na amount. Okay? Dalawa yan, ah, estate tax and uh, tax amnesty on delinquencies. You, you, you pay attention to this ah, because the estate tax amnesty is about to expire on June 14, 2021. Nagsimula ang tax amnesty natin, ang estate tax amnesty, two years ago. The estate tax amnesty application is good only for two years. Started on June 15, uh, 2019. Okay? And it will end on June 14, 2021. Okay? So, sino ang pwede mag-apply sa estate tax amnesty? The estate of decedents who died on or before or, or on until December 31, 2017. Okay, hanggang December 31, yung mga namatay, hanggang December 31, 2017, and prior years or prior date, sila ang qualified sa estate tax amnesty. So kung ang decedent ay namatay January 1, 2018 onwards, hindi sila pasok sa estate tax amnesty. And what is the benefit of availing the estate tax amnesty? Uh, a lower rate of 6% will apply. No penalties and interest are to be imposed. Hindi ka magbabayad ng penalties, hindi ka magbabayad ng interest. So yung mga problema na mga na, natin na yung properties ni Lolo, ni Lola, o nung, nung, nung parents mo, na hindi mo matransfer yung title doon sa lupa, sa shares of stocks, and other registrable properties because sobrang laki na ng buwis, because of the interest and taxes. Namatay yan, let's say 1990, hindi mo na asikaso yung settlement ng estate niyan. So tumakbo ng tumakbo yung interest niyan, lumaki ng lumaki yung interest until such time na na-discourage ka na, na isettle yung estate. Kasi ang laki na ng babayaran mo. Now this is the opportunity for you okay, to transfer the title over these properties without paying too much. Ang requirement lang sa'yo, bayaran mo ang 6% of the taxable estate. Walang interest, walang penalties na babayaran ka. Okay? And ang maganda pa nito, ang valuation na gagamitin is of course no, the, val the value of the property at the time of death of the decedent. Okay? So mind you, ha, take note of the deadline. Malapit na ito. Isang buwan na lang. Exactly one month from now, matatapos na itong estate tax amnesty application. But as a development, no, the House of Representatives already passed a bill Okay, extending the application for the estate tax amnesty. So pumasa na ito sa House of Representatives and the bill is now being deliberated at the Senate. So I'm not sure kung within a span of one month ay eh, kayang ipasa ito ng Senate para ma-extend ang application ng estate tax amnesty. What about tax amnesty on delinquency? So these are uh, uh, taxes that has become delinquent already. It's either because you failed to file an appeal to the Court of Tax Appeals, no, the assessment becomes final because you failed to file an appeal to the Court of Tax Appeals. You failed to file a protest on the preliminary assessment or na issue ka na ng, ng garnishment and distraint. No? So, mga delinquent account na natin yan. Okay? Uh, ang rate dito, nagre-range ng 40% up to uh, 50%. Okay? Ito yung mga rates dito na pwede mong i-apply on tax amnesties on delinquencies. Under the law, originally, the tax amnesty on delinquency, one year lamang ang period of application. Supposedly, mag-e-end yan April 2020. 
dapat mag-e-end yan April of 2020. But because, ano, everybody knows what happened last year because of the pandemic, na-extend yung period of application niya. Nalipat yan ng June 30 until such time na-extend ulit. Nalipat yan ng December uh, 31, 2020. And now, nakaroon na ng final extension until June 30, 2021 ang application ng tax amnesty on delinquencies natin. So, una mag-expire itong estate tax uh, amnesty. Okay? So, that is our package 1B. Now, what is the third package? The third package is for the corporate income tax. Originally, now originally, this uh, corporate income tax reform is dubbed as trabaho bill. Ang tawag sa kanya nung una ay trabaho bill or the tax reform for attracting better and high quality opportunities. Later on, the trabaho bill was renamed to sitira bill. Sitira means Corporate Income Tax and Incentives Reform Act. Okay? But because of the pandemic that happened last year, the trabaho then sitira, okay, was recalibrated. Okay, it was recalibrated to uh, to help okay the corporate taxpayers or our uh, businesses to recover from the onslaught of the pandemic. And one of the ways to help the company or the business to recover is to impose a lower tax. Okay, to impose a lower tax or to grant some reprieves or to grant some additional allowable deductions. Yun ang nangyari sa Sitira. Kaya ito ay na-recalibrate okay, to address the, the onslaught of the pandemic, the effect, the adverse effect of, of the pandemic to the businesses and now renamed to Create Bill or the Corporate Recovery. Kaya dinagdag tong recovery. Okay? The Corporate Recovery and Tax Incentives for Enterprises Act. So nagkaroon siya ng, ng overhauling. No? So, as I could say, no, for me and personally, uh, naging responsive ang Congress dito sa need ng, 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 uh, ng uh, business uh, community ng mga businesses natin. Naging responsive sila. Bakit? Because of the pandemic, kailangan nating uh, baguhin, kailangan nating uh, make sure na mag-a-adapt okay, ang ating pinapasang batas doon sa present condition ng mga businesses natin or ng mga taxpayers natin. Kaya ang naipasang batas, I create bill. Okay. Another general principle of taxation. The bill originated at the House of Representatives. Before it was passed or before the, the, the Senate can, can have its own version. Okay. And that is a constitutional provision. You will recall, okay, you will recall in Section 24, okay, Section 24, Article 6, of the 1987 Constitution, it says that all appropriations, revenue, tariff bills, bills increasing public debts, bills of local application, and private bills shall originate exclusively from the House of Representatives. But the Senate may concur or propose amendments. Diba? Yan ang ating constitutional provision. Okay? Yung apat, yung, no, no, yung anim na specific bills na yon, appropriation, revenue, revenue na nakasama dito ang tax, ito yung tax bills natin, revenue bill, okay? tariff, bills increasing public debts, uh, bills of local application, and private bills. Ang sabi ng constitution, it will originate exclusively from the House of Representatives. So yung Senate, walang gagawin or walang magagawa ang Senate, the Senate cannot pass okay, a tax bill and submit it to the President for signature on their own. Walang magagawa ang Senate kundi maghintay kung ano ang ipapasa ng House of Representatives. Okay? Kung ano ang ipapasa ng House of Representatives. Kung ang House of Representatives ay walang revenue bill, walang tax bill na ipinapasa, walang magagawa ang Senate kundi maghintay. Ngayon, dahil may create bill na sa House of Representatives, ipapasa na nila sa, sa, sa Senate, ang Senate, pwede na ngayon magkaroon ng sariling version ng create bill. 
no? And if there are inconsistencies or, or conflicting provisions, they have the bicam to reconcile the, the, the to harmonize the two bills. Okay? Ang isang example niyan, private bill, no? In in the last in, in, in the recent time, no? In the news, yung, yung renewal ng franchise of a certain broadcasting company. Okay? Franchise is a private bill because it will be given to a private entity. Ano? Okay? So, anong nangyari? Di ba kahit it appears na sa Senate, okay, yung application, yung renewal of franchise, but in the House, no? They they uh, they did not approve the application. Ano nangyari? Walang nagawa ang Senate because pri uh, franchise, franchise is a private bill which is under the Constitution, must originate exclusively from the House of Representatives. The leading case here is the case of Arturo Tolentino versus Secretary of Finance. No? Uh, ang, ang sabi doon ng Supreme Court, no? hindi pinagbabawalan ng Senate na mag-propose, mag-concord with the amendments on the draft or the proposed bill of the House of Representatives as long as the initiative of enacting a bill or passing a bill comes from the House of Representatives. Okay, tatandaan natin na yung anim na bill na yon kasama ang tax bill or ang revenue bill, ganoon ang nangyari, ganoon ang pinagdaanan ng create bill. Okay, dumaan muna yan sa House of Representatives and then umakyat sa Senate, nagkaroon ng bicameral conference committee, representatives of the Senate, representatives of the House of Representatives to uh, to harmonize their, their, their respective versions and then the uh, the congress submitted the bill to the president for signature at ganun nga nangyari okay why is it important that we have uh, an amendment of our corporate income tax if you if you see no the philippines is or has the highest corporate income tax among asean countries tayo pilipinas ang may pinakamataas na corporate income tax. Okay? Our domestic corporation, our uh, resident foreign corporation, and non-resident foreign corporation, even partnerships and joint ventures, they are taxed at a rate of 30% on their taxable income or gross income as the case may be. Okay? At tayo yung pinakamataas sa ASEAN countries. You look at Singapore, they have the lowest since 2010 at 17. Okay? At 17%. So this is one of the issues that 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 the the government would like to address no if you are a businessman and you are choosing a country where you want to do business titingnan mo yung mga taxes nila di ba so yung ibang bansa mas mas nagiging attractive sila for businesses okay or for investors because they have lower tax rates they have uh, they the, the, their government imposes okay lower uh, income tax as compared to the philippines which has the highest, 30%. So how can we be competitive? Paano natin ma-attract yung mga investors to come here to the Philippines kung ang sobrang taas ng ating income tax? So that's one of the issues na ni-resolve dito sa CREATE law natin. Okay. So there you are. We have Republic Act number 1154 or the CREATE law. So what are the salient features of this CREATE law? Number one, it was signed into law on March 26, 2021. So, one day, bago mag-lapse into law, di ba sa constitution natin, kapag isinabmit na ng Congress yung bill at hindi ito na pirmahan ng presidente within 30 days, uh, the bill becomes a law by uh, uh, through lapse of time. Right? So, nagiging batas na siya. Eh, nasubmit yan around February 2020. February 27. So March 27 or no no 25 ata. February 25. So March 27 maglalaps na siya uh, into law but on March 26 pinirmahan siya. But the president vetoed nine provisions. The president vetoed nine provisions. The law was published in newspaper of general circulation on March 27. And under the create law the law will take effect 15 days after the complete publication. So kapag tinanong ka, kailan ang general effectivity date ng CREATE, ang sagot, April 11, 2021. That is the general effectivity date of the CREATE law. However, tatandaan natin class, ha? ito ang dapat mong bantayan. Ang, ang mahirap dito sa CREATE law o ang nagpapalito dito sa CREATE law ay ang napakarami at ibat ibang 
effectivity dates ng mga provision. Yan ang na, na nagpapalito dyan. Yan ang na nagpapahirap. Yung iba't iba at napakaraming effectivity dates. Okay? Bakit? Because may mga provisions sa CREATE law na uh, siya ay effective July 1, 2020. Tingnan mo class. Napirmahan siya March 26, napublish March 27, pero effective July 1, 2020. So nakaroon ng retroactive application. Okay? May mga provisions, hindi lahat, ulitin ko ha, hindi lahat ng provisions sa CREATE law ay may retroactive application. Hindi lahat. Okay? Meron diyang specific provisions, pag-uusapan natin mamaya, na nag-retroact ng July 1, 2020. The question is, is it allowed? Can tax laws be given retroactive application? Okay? The general rule is, tax laws are to be applied prospectively. Okay? That's the general rule. Tax laws are to be applied prospectively. But, if the law expressly so provides, or it can be implied from the language or the letters of the law, and the retroactive application is not prejudicial to the taxpayer, then the law can be given a retroactive effect. Okay? The law can be given a retroactive effect. Ulitin natin. The general rule is tax laws shall be prospective in application. From today, going to the future. It does not operate backward. Okay? As an exception, tax laws can be given retroactive application if it is expressly provided by the law or can be implied from the language of the law and its retroactive application is not prejudicial to the taxpayer. Okay? May mga provisions din dyan sa train law na limited period of application lang. Okay? Meron lang July 1, 2020 up to June 30, 2023. May mga provisions of later application or later ang effectivity like January 1, 2022. Okay? So tatandaan natin na pag tinanong ka, itong provision na to, okay, kailan ito magte-take effect? Tingnan mo yung provision ng batas kung nagbigay ng effectivity date. Ulitin ko lang nga sa create law, sa create law. Tingnan mo ang provision ng batas kung nagbigay ng effectivity date. Kung nagbigay yan ng effectivity date, sundin mo ang effectivity date na nakalagay diyan sa provision na yan sa create law. Papaano kung walang nakalagay na effectivity date doon sa provision na yon? Then apply the general effectivity date, April 11, 2021. Okay? Tingnan ang provision kung may nakalagay na effectivity date. Kung meron, sundin mo yan. Okay? Sundin mo yan. Kung walang nakalagay na effectivity date, then the general effectivity date of CREATE law will apply. April 11, 2021. And a significant okay, uh, amendment made by the CREATE law is the creation of Title 13 on tax incentives. Okay? This tax incentives is no longer part or covered by the syllabus in taxation for the bar exam. But uh, papadaanan natin din ito uh, mamaya no? para may idea uh, tayo. So ang question dito is ito bang create law ay makakasama assuming uh, uh, matutuloy ang bar exam this year for November 2021 bar exam. Makakasama ba ang create law? No? Some would say na yes, kasama ito. Some would say hindi. Okay? Kasi ang nakalagay daw doon sa ang nakalagay daw doon sa syllabus natin nag-cut off September 20. Uh, September 2020. Ano eh ito 2021 na pata, na yung effectivity uh, na pirmahan, yung batas. Kaya lang may retroactive effect. July 1, 2020. So pasok sa cut off. No? Pasok sa cut off. For me, my personal opinion is ma maiisama ito. My personal opinion is maiisama to because of the retroactive effect of the law. But I think the Supreme Court, no, the, the, the Bar Committee should make a definite uh, announcement in this matter. No, Kung isasama ba ang provision na to ng create law sa bar exam. But for me, my personal take is uh, kasama siya or pwede siyang isama 
sa 2021 bar exam. Okay? So these are the salient features of the Corporate uh, Recovery and Tax Incentives for Enterprises Act for your CREATE law. Okay? Now, let's go to the specific details. Okay? What are the changes introduced by the CREATE law? Okay, una. Doon sa non-resident alien engage in trade or business. For non-resident alien engage in trade or business. The train law amended section 25, letter A, number 2. Okay? Under the NIRC, under the NIRC, if we are going to read, this is tax on certain passive income, specifically prices and winnings. Okay? Specifically prices and winnings. Under the NIRC, other winnings except Philippine charity sweepstakes and lotto winnings shall be subject to income tax of 20% on the total amount. Okay? Ano ang interpretation natin dito? Under the NIRC, okay, the general rule is that other winnings is subject to final income tax of 20%. That's the general rule. Okay? Winnings, okay? Other winnings or winnings are subject to final income tax of 20%. However, PCSO and lotto winnings, regardless of amount, okay? PCSO and lotto winnings, regardless of amount, are exempt sa income tax. Okay? That's under the NIRC. That is under the NIRC. Okay? Sino ang taxpayer na pinag-uusapan natin dito? Non-resident alien engaged in trade or business. However, noong ipinasa ang train law, noong pinasa ang train law, inamend ang rule sa winnings ng resident ng citizen. So sa resident citizen, non-resident citizen, and resident alien, binago ang rule with respect to winnings. Ang rule under the train law is that ang general rule, winnings is subject to 20% final income tax. But for PCSO and lotto winnings, again, for PCSO and lotto winnings, under the train law to ha, ulitin ko ha, under the train law, PCSO and lotto winnings Okay? Not exceeding 10,000 are exempted sa income tax. And if the PCSO and lotto winnings okay, exceeds 10,000 pesos, it will be subject to 20% okay, final income tax. Okay? Ulitin natin ha. Winnings ang pinag-uusapan natin dito. Winnings. Sino yung taxpayer natin? Non-resident alien engaged in trade or business. Okay? Anong batas ang tinitingnan natin? NIRC. Ano ang sabi ng NIRC? General rule, ang winnings ay subject sa final income tax of 20%. Exception, okay? PCSO and lotto winnings. Sila ay exempt regardless of the amount regardless of the amount non resident alien nirc winnings yan yung diniskas ko kanina is under train law okay yung diniskas ko kanina under train law sino ang taxpayer resident citizen non resident citizen resident alien ano ang rule sa kanila general rule 20 percent ang winnings. Pero, kapag PCSO and lotto winnings, itingnan mo, not exceeding 10,000, exempt. Exceeding 10,000, 20 percent. Okay. Nakita? Nasundan? Okay. Train law, sino ang taxpayer? Resident citizen, Non-resident citizen, resident alien. Anong rule? General rule, winnings, 20% final income tax. PCSO and lotto winnings, not exceeding 10,000 exempt. 
exceeding 10,000 20% final income tax. Pero ano ang nangyari sa non-resident alien? Hindi yan nagalaw ng train law. Mukhang naiwan. Mukhang nakalimutan ang provision na yan sa non-resident alien. Kaya ang ginawa ng create ko ay pinatay na, pinagpare-pareho na sila. Kaya tingnan nyo class yung changes dito. Ang ginawa ng train law ay kung ano ang changes, ah, sorry, ang ginawa ng create law, kung ano ang changes sa train law inadapt, inapply sa non-resident alien engaged in trade. For other winnings, except winnings amounting to 10,000 pesos or less, from the Philippine Charity Sweepstakes shall be exempt. So, under the, under the CREATE law, ha? under the CREATE law, ito na rin ang rule natin. Wala na ito. Wala na ito. Kasi nga, parang naiwan lang yan doon sa changes introduced by the train law. Okay? Eh parang ang nangyari, kung hindi mo babaguhin, kung hindi mo babaguhin, eh in a better situation, itong non-resident alien engaged in trade pag nanalo sila sa loto. Di ba? Okay? Kasi pag nanalo sila sa loto, exempted sila under the NIRC. But under CREATE law, ang sabi, ay hindi. Exempted ka lang kapag ang napanalunan mo ay hindi lumampas ng 10,000. Pag lumampas ng 10,000 ang napanalunan mo, subject ka na. 20% final income tax. But let me, let me, let me clear that class. Ha? Kapag hindi lumampas ng 10,000, ulitin ko, exempt. Kapag lumampas ng 10,000, yung buong amount ang subject sa 20%. Hindi in excess of 10,000. Okay? Halimbawa, ang napanalunan mo ay 50,000. The full 50,000 is subject to 20%. Okay? Hindi yung babawasin muna natin yung 10,000 kasi yung 10,000 daw ay exempt, tapos 40,000 lang yung subject sa 20%. No. Hindi ganyan. The whole amount, as long as it exceeds 10,000, will be subject to 20% final income tax. Pare-pareho na sila. Pare-pareho na ang rule sa resident citizen, resident alien, non-resident citizen, and non-resident alien engaged in trade or business. Pare-pareho ang rule. General rule, 20%. Kapag PCSO or lotto winnings, tingnan mo, lumampas ng 10,000. Kapag hindi, exempt. Pag lumampas ng 10,000, subject sa 20% final income tax. Okay? Eh, iba ang rule kapag non-resident alien not engaged in trade or business. Di ba lahat ng income non derived from sources within the Philippines ay gross income tax of 25%. Okay? Gross income tax of 25%. Except those items subject to capital gains tax. Okay? Let's continue. Ano pa yung mga significant changes under the CREATE law? And corporation. Under Section 22B of the tax code, the term corporation shall include partnership no matter how created or organized, joint stock association, etc., etc. What is the change introduced by the CREATE law? In the definition, it now specifically includes or expressly includes one-person corporation. Okay. Well, of course, that is brought about by uh, the uh, uh, revision of our corporation code. Yung BP 68 natin uh, is now revised by Republic Act 11232 or the Revised Corporation Code of the Philippines. And under the Revised Corporation Code of the Philippines, we now have what we call as one-person corporation. Okay. And what do we mean by OPC or one-person corporation? A corporation with a single stockholder. Okay? Single stockholder. Kahit ikaw ay married, pwede ka pa rin maging, maging incorporator ng one-person corporation. Hindi naman ibig sabihin na single ay status yung single. Ang ibig sabihin niya, isa. Okay? One-person corporation is a corporation with a single stockholder. Okay? And only natural person trust or an entity may form one person corporation so if you want to know more of this one person corporation you may refer to your revised corporation code ang pag-uusapan lang natin dito ay ang tax aspect before kasi there is a confusion on what tax will apply to one person corporation will you treat one person corporation like a sole proprietor di ba ang sole proprietor mag-isa lang din at siya lang din ang may-ari 
ng business? Parang ganoon din ang one person corporation except for some formalities required by the SEC, iisa lang din ang may-ari sa one person corporation. Though you shall nominate an alternate, okay? Or a nominee doon sa one person corporation. But basically, pareho lang sila ng sole proprietor. Iisa ang may-ari. Okay? Iisa ang may-ari. And that person is engaged in business. That person is engaged in business. So, kung individual siya, what kind of income earner is that sole proprietor? Hindi ba siya ay self-employed? Self-employed individual. Okay? So now, it is clear. One person corporation is included in the definition of a corporation. So what is the implication if that one person corporation is included in the definition of a corporation? Then, all tax treatments applicable to a corporation will apply to one person corporation. Okay? If that one person corporation is a domestic corporation, then the regular corporate income tax will apply. The MCIT will apply. Okay? The improperly accumulated earnings tax will apply depending on the period. Okay? Pag-uusapan natin yung improperly accumulated mamaya. Okay? And when, when profits okay, are distributed or taken by the single stockholder, then that will be subject to 10% dividend tax. Okay? When there is a declaration of dividends from the one-person corporation to the single stockholder. Yun ang effect niya. That one-person corporation will be treated as a regular corporation. Okay? As a regular corporation. Okay? So, so that's it, no? Yan ang changes natin in the definition of a corporation. So, ikaw, kung tanongin ka, uh, ano mas maganda? Mag-solve proprietorship na lang? Or mag-create ka or mag-establish ka ng one-person corporation. Which is better? A sole proprietorship or a one-person corporation? Okay? So, may mga disadvantages yan and advantages, no? Remember, class, no? If you are a self-employed, if you are a self-employed individual and you choose to be a sole proprietor, no? You choose to be a sole proprietor. Di ba yung pinag-usapan natin kanina, you look at your gross sales or receipts and other non-operating income. Okay? Whether it is not exceeding 3 million or exceeding 3 million. At kapag hindi lumampas ng 3 million, you have the option to be taxed at 8% in excess of 250,000. Right? Or at graduated rate. Samantalang kapag 3 million ka, automatic graduated rate. Right? If you are a sole proprietorship, you will be taxed in that manner. Okay? You will be taxed in that manner. If you are a one-person corporation, you will be treated like a corporation. You compute your gross income. Okay? You deduct your allowable deduction, whether itemized deduction, or optional standard deduction. Okay? You have here your taxable income and you multiply it with the regular corporate income tax rate to arrive at your tax liability. Ganyan ang pagkakaiba niyan. Okay? But the thing here, class, is kung ikaw ay mag-a-avail ng OSD, kung ikaw ay mag-a-avail ng optional standard deduction, what is optional standard deduction again? A rate of 40%. Diba? A rate of 40%. If you are an individual like this one, if you are an individual like this one, your 40% is based on gross sales or gross receipts. But if you are a corporation which includes one person corporation, your 40% OSD is based on your gross income. Okay? Magkaiba. Magkaiba yung nagiging tax treatment. So, titingnan mo ngayon. Tatanungin mo ngayon yung kliyente mo. Ito po ang mga benefits if you are a sole proprietor or kung ikaw ay mag magre-register as one person corporation. Magkaiba ang rates na mag apply It can be graduated. It can be 8% kung ikaw ay self-employed. Pero kung OPC ka, yung rate ng corporation, the regular corporate income tax of the corporation will apply to you. 
in terms of allowable deductions sa OSD, magkaiba ang base na paggagamitan ninyo. The individual, 40% of the gross sales or gross receipts. While the corporation, 40% of the gross income. Magkaiba yan ha. Magkaiba ang gross sales at gross receipts sa gross income. So that's how are you going to compare now. And let your client decide which, which he or she thinks is better for his or her business. Okay? Now, let us continue. Speaking of regular corporate income tax. For domestic corporation, let us start sa section 27A of the tax code. This is one of the sections amended by the CREATE law. Domestic corporation, regular corporate income tax. Under the National Internal Revenue Code, the regular corporate income tax is 30% on the taxable income. That is 30% of the taxable income. Okay? Again, how do you compute your taxable income? Your section 31 of the tax code tells us the taxable income is the pertinent items of gross income less allowable deductions. Okay? And that is your taxable income. The difference between gross income and allowable deduction, that is your taxable income. Okay? You multiply this by 30% to arrive at the regular corporate income tax under the NIRC. That's how you compute it under the NIRC. Kung titignan natin class, a uniform rate of 10% will apply regardless of the size of the corporation. Whether the corporation is small, medium, micro, or large corporation, one rate will apply. And that is 30%. Regardless of your as the size, the value, the amount of your assets, 30% lang ang mag-a-apply dyan. Uniform kayong lahat ng corporation. Malaki, maliit, medium size, lahat kayo ay pantay-pantay ang tingin ng NIRC. 30% will apply on your taxable income. That is one of the issues. Create law tries to resolve. And that is by introducing a new rate for domestic corporation, a lower rate, and a much lower rate for medium, small, and micro enterprises. Doon sa ating mga MSMEs, mas maliit ang tax rate nila. Now, let us talk about that. Under the CREATE law, the general rule is that domestic corporation shall be liable to 25% on the taxable income. How do you compute the taxable income again? Like this one. That's how you compute it. Gross income minus allowable deduction. That's the general rule. 25%. But a lower rate of 20% will apply on the taxable income if you fall into the category of uh, my, micro, small, medium enterprise. At ano ang criteria? The net taxable income is not exceeding 5 million. Okay? Yan ang unang criteria. The net taxable income should not exceed 5 million. And the total asset should not exceed 100 million. Again, the net income should not exceed 5 million. And the total asset should not exceed 100 million. If you are able to satisfy these two mandatory requirements, you are qualified to avail the 20% regular corporate income tax. Mas mababa ang rate mo dahil maliit ang kumpanya mo, dahil maliit ang corporation mo. Okay? And these two requirements, not exceeding 5 million taxable income, and not exceeding 100 million total income, these two requirements must concur. Okay? The absence of one will disqualify you from availing the lower rate of 20%. It will disqualify you. Dapat present yung dalawa. The absence of one will disqualify you. One more thing. In the total asset of not exceeding 100,000, the value of the land is excluded. Hindi kasama yung land where the office, the plant, and the equipment are situated during the taxable year. Hindi mo siya sasama. Okay? So how will we know kung magkano siya? In your audited financial statements, Revenue Regulation 5, 
2020-2020 requires that the value of the land should be separately presented from the other fixed assets of the company. So may separate line item na sa audited financial statements. Land, magkano? Other, other property, plant, and equipment, magkano? So di ba usually sa audited financial statements natin, kasama doon sa PPE, property, plant, and equipment, yung land. So ang gagawin mo, ikakarve out mo na lang yung land. You will present it separately from the rest of the other fixed asset in the audited financial statement. So that nalaman ng BIR kung magkano ang total assets mo, excluding the land. Again, the total asset should exclude the land where the office, the plant, and the equipment are situated during the taxable year. Okay? The two requirements, 5 million taxable income, not exceeding, and not exceeding 100,000 uh, total asset. Okay? And this provision, the 25% and the 20% may retroactive application. Kailan ang retroactive niya? Effective July 1, 2020. Effective July 1, 2020. So, maraming corporations ang nakapag-file na nito. Nakapag-avail kasi na lumampas na tayo sa April 15 deadline natin. Eh. Okay? So, may mga nag-file na dyan. Nakapag-file ng karamihan sa atin. Especially those whose uh, taxable year ends on December 31, 2020. Okay? Ulitin natin ha. NIRC. The rule, the regular corporate income tax for domestic corporation is 30% on the taxable income. But under the CREATE law, it was lowered to 25% only. And it is uh, lowered again to 20% if you are able to satisfy these two requirements. Okay? These two requirements. So yung mga maliliit na company, yung mga maliliit na company, mas maliit na rin yung tax na babayaran nila. Yung mga malalaki, edi magbayad kayo ng malaki. 25%. Again, the effectivity is July 1, 2020. Okay? Now, Nasa domestic corporation pa rin tayo. Okay. Uh, yung, you will recall in section 27, there is an optional gross income tax of 15% that the president may, uh, may approve the imposition if certain conditions uh, are met. For example, the GDP ratio, the VAT collection, etc. Et Pero hindi naman yan ay patupad eh. Okay? Dahil hindi naman inaprubahan ng, ng, ng mga presidenteng nakaraan natin. Okay? So under the CREATE law, there is now an express repeal. Hindi na natin makikita yung provision na yan ng 15% optional gross income tax for corporations. So wala na yan, ha? wala na yung optional 15% gross income, which never naman talagang naging applicable. Never naman yan naging applicable. Kasi nga, hindi naman inaprubahan ng presidente. Okay? Uh, what about Section 27B? proprietary educational institution. Okay, medyo may counting issue dito eh. Sa proprietary educational institutions and hospitals. Okay? You will find this in section 27B of your tax code. And I call it uh, some of the well, I quote unquote special corporations because they enjoy a preferential rate. Preferential because the rate is lower, 10% on the taxable income. Okay? So, sino-sino ba itong mga proprietary educational institution and proprietary hospital? Una, when you say proprietary educational institution, it refers to any private schools which are non-profit. Ito yung nagpagulo dyan eh. Which are non-profit. And administered by private individuals. Issued by a permit by DepEd, CHED, or TESDA, depending on the year level. Uh, Pre-elementary, elementary, high school, senior high, DepEd. Tertiary, postgraduate, CHED, TESDA for vocational. Okay? Ang, ang, ang kwan dito ay private school. Ito ang operative dyan. Private school. Administered by private individuals. Okay? Mga private school. Okay? Kaya lang class. Ituloy ko lang ha proprietary hospital hospital okay that is private proprietary hospital administered by private individual or group kaya lang ito na naman dinagdagan which are non profit ano ba ang ibig sabihin ng non profit ito non profit means no net income or asset accrues to or benefits any member of specific person 
with all the net income or assets devoted to the institution's purposes and all its activities conducted not for profit. So ibig sabihin, hindi nagdi-distribute ng profit sa mga members okay, ng corporation. Okay, kaya lang class, dito nagkaroon ng issue. Okay, dito nagkaroon ng issue. For me, pag sinabi mong for me, pag sinabi mong proprietary educational institution or proprietary hospital, yan ay private hospital for profit. Pribadong hospital, pribadong, uh, is, pribadong school na gustong kumita ng mga may-ari. For me, a proprietary educational institution or proprietary hospital is legally inexistent. Kung ayaw mong kumita, kung, uh, not, hindi man ayaw mong kumita, but kung ayaw mong mag-distribute ng profit among your members, then you can go non-stock, non-profit, as easy as that. Okay? But I, I heard there are moves from certain educational institution associations no, here in Metro Manila and outside Metro Manila who would like to have these things clarified no, with respect to this non-profit organization. Okay? So, let us try to explain this now. You have here educational institution. And this educational institution can be categorized into two. Government educational institution and private educational institution. Okay, walang problema sa government educational institution. Automatically exempted ang mga yan. Okay, ang pag-usapan natin itong private. Private educational institution can be proprietary educational institution or non-stock non-profit. Non-stock non-profit. For proprietary educational institution, which under Section 27B should be non-profit, they are liable to a preferential rate of 10% on their taxable income, provided not more than 50% of their gross income will come from unrelated business activity. Yun ang requirement. Para ma-avail ng proprietary educational institution, yung preferential rate of 10%, okay, not more than 50% of the gross income will come from unrelated. Hindi po pwede na ang income ng proprietary educational institution galing sa unrelated, hindi galing sa pagiging school, hindi galing tuition fee, miscellaneous fee, etc. Halimbawa, ang paaralan ay may building, commercial building, pinaparentahan niya. Mas malaki pa ang income sa commercial, ng renta sa commercial building kaysa sa tuition fee ng mga estudyante. You cannot avail the preferential rate of 10%. Okay, the regular corporate income tax rate of 25% or 20% will apply to you. Okay? So to avail the 10%, hindi dapat lalampas ng 50% ang income mo galing sa unrelated activity. So i-maintain mo yung unrelated activity mo, yung income mo sa unrelated activity mo. Make sure na hindi lalampas ng 50% of the total gross income para ma-avail yung 10%. Pag lumampas ng 50%, the regular corporate income tax of 25% or 20% will now apply to you. Second, na dapat nating tandaan, if the proprietary educational institution is qualified to use the preferential rate of 10%, that proprietary educational institution is not liable to MCIT. Okay? Kapag ikaw ay qualified sa 10%, you are not liable to 10 to 2% MCIT. But if you are not qualified to 10%, meaning to say the tax is 25% or 20%, okay? The tax is 25% or 20%, regular corporate income tax na nag-apply sa iyo, liable ka sa MCIT. Okay? Kung ayaw mo maging liable sa MCIT, maintain okay, the income from unrelated activity to not exceed 50%. Para ma-avail mo yung 10%. Ulitin ko ha, pag qualified ka sa 10%, hindi ka liable sa MCIT. Pero pag ikaw ay hindi qualified sa 10%, regular corporate income tax ang mag apply sa'yo, then you may now be held liable to MCIT. And you will pay whichever is higher between the two. Okay? Clear. For non-stock, non-profit educational institution, the incomes, okay, the revenues 
of the non-stock, non-profit educational institution are exempt sa income tax under one condition as long as the incomes are actually directly and exclusively used for educational purposes. That's the only requirement under the Constitution. Okay? Under Section 4, Paragraph 3 of Article 14 of the 1987 Constitution, as reiterated by the Supreme Court in the case of Commissioner of Internal Revenue versus De La Salle University, a November 2016 case uh, penned by Justice Brayon. Okay? Ang requirement lang, just show proof that the revenues are actually directly and exclusively used for educational purposes. That's the only requirement of the Constitution. Okay? We don't look at the source of the income. We don't look at the source of the revenue. We look at the use of the revenue. Are you using it actually, directly and exclusively for educational purposes? If the answer is yes, then you are exempted sa income tax. Okay? Now, ano yung ginawa ng pin law? Look at, under the NIRC, preferential rate of 10% on taxable income. But under the CREATE law, okay, the general rule pa rin, 10% pa rin ang mag apply But for a limited period of time, from July 1, 2020, up to June 30, 2023, a preferential rate of 1% will apply to proprietary educational institution and hospital. Di ba kanina nang pinag-usapan natin yung salient features? Nang, uh, nung pinag-usapan natin ang salient features of the CREATE law, ang sabi ko sa inyo, may mga provisions sa CREATE law na limited period of application. This is one of those. Okay? So ang general rule pa rin sa proprietary educational institution, preferential rate of 10% will apply. But for a limited period of time, from July 1, 2020, up to June 30, 2023, 1% ang mag apply sa kanya. Ano ang ibig sabihin niyan? Pagpatak ng July 1, 2023, balik sa 10% ang proprietary educational institution. Bakit binabaan ng 1%? Kasi nga po, ang mga ospital natin at ang mga paaralan ay apektado rin ng pandemya. Kaya as a form of, uh, as a way of, of, of recovery, no, at least a reprieve, no, babaan natin ang tax nila for a period of three years. Okay, three years lang. Unang-una, wala namang gusto na pahabain pa ng last past three years ang pandemya na to. Diba? So, tandaan natin yun na, 10% pa din, but for a limited period of time, for a period of three years, July 1, 2020, up to June 30, 2023, 1% ang mag apply sa kanila. Pagpatak ng July 1, 2023, balik sa 10% ang mag apply sa kanila. Ano ang kulatilya natin? Not more than 50% will come from unrelated activity. Pag hindi mo na satisfy yan, regular corporate income tax will apply. At kung liable ka sa regular corporate income tax, now you can, you may be liable to MCIT. And you compare the two, you pay whichever is higher. Okay? Now, what about corporate dividend? Ayan, may changes din dito sa domestic corporation intercorporate dividend. So, meron tayo dito yung dalawang table, pinagkukumpara natin <clears throat> yung uh, intercorporate dividends, no? Una, uh, for declaring corporation, pag tingnan natin ito ha, declaring corporation, tatlo. Domestic corporation, resident foreign corporation, non-resident foreign corporation. Sila ang mga, mga nagdi-declare ng dividendo. Sino ang shareholder? Sino ang recipient? Domestic corporation. Siya ang stockholder. Okay? Siya ang stockholder. Kapag ang nag-declare ng dividend, if the domestic corporation declares the dividend, you call it as what? Local source dividend. But if the dividend is declared by resident foreign corporation and non-resident foreign corporation, you call it as foreign source dividend. Okay? So under the NIRC, under the NIRC, if the declaring corporation, if the domestic corporation declares the dividend and the domestic corporation received it, ano ang tax liability niya? Exempted. Ulit, sino ang nag-declare? Domestic corporation. Sino ang nag-declare? Domestic corporation. Sino nakatanggap ng dividendo? Domestic corporation. 
Ano ang tax liability niya? Exempted yung domestic corporation sa income tax. Okay? Pero kapag ang nag-declare ng dividend ay resident foreign corporation at non-resident foreign corporation, ang nakatanggap ay domestic corporation. Okay? That dividend is subject to regular corporate income tax. The dividend will be included in the gross income subject to the regular corporate income tax. Okay? Kaya kung naalala nyo, di ba, sa section 32 of the tax code, gross income, di ba, divided into to yan. Letter A, inclusions. Letter B, exclusions. Doon sa letter A, may 11 items na enumerated. 11 items included in the gross income. Doon sa number 7, doon sa number 7, nandyan, dividends. Di ba? Number 7, dividend. Kasama yan sa gross income. Okay? Ito yung example niyan. Na yung dividend received ay subject, ay kasama sa gross income, subject sa regular corporate income tax. Ulitin natin na, kapag ang nag-declare ay domestic corporation, ang nakatanggap ay domestic corporation, exempted sa income tax. Pero pag ang nag-declare ay foreign corporation, whether resident or non-resident, at ang nakatanggap ng dividendo ay domestic corporation, that dividend is included in the gross income subject to regular corporate income tax. Okay? Now, what are the changes introduced by the CREATE law? What are the changes introduced by the CREATE law? Look, if the declaring corporation is a domestic corporation at ang nakareceive ay domestic corporation, exempted pa rin. Okay? Pareho lang sila ha, ng NIRC. Domestic ang nag-declare, domestic ang nakareceive, exempted pa rin. Okay? Pero, if the declaring corporation is a foreign corporation, meaning to say, the dividend is a foreign source dividend, ah, iba na ang rule natin. Di ba under the NIRC, regular corporate income tax ang babayaran nila? Under the NIRC, regular corporate income tax. Under the CREATE law, regular corporate income tax is only the general rule. Okay? So, dividends declared by foreign corporation received by domestic corporation may now be exempt from income tax when conditions are met. Diyan ang nabago. Walang nabago doon sa domestic receipt declared by a domestic received by a domestic. Exempted pa rin yan. Walang nabago. Okay? Ang nabago, yung foreign corporation na nag-declare natanggap ng domestic corporation. Noon, under the NIRC, automatically subject yan sa regular corporate income tax. Pero ngayon, Ang general rule, regular corporate income tax. Ang exception, exempted sa income tax when conditions are met. Now, what are these conditions that will tell us or that will help us or that will enable a domestic corporation to avail the tax exemption on dividend? Number one, the dividends are actually received or remitted into the Philippines and are reinvested in the business operations of a domestic corporation within the taxable year from the time the foreign source dividends are received. Take note ha, actually received or remitted. Hindi po pwede yung constructive receipt. Okay? Number two, dividends received shall be used to fund the working capital requirement capital expenditure, dividend payment, investment in domestic subsidiaries, infrastructure projects. And number three, the domestic corporation holds directly at least 20% in value of the outstanding shares of a foreign corporation and has held the shareholdings uninterruptedly for a minimum of two years. Okay? Pero kung ang corporation naman is existing for less than two years, edi eh dapat continuous ang pagmamayari mo ng 20%. Okay? So ulitin ko lang ha, kapag ang mga conditions na to ay present, kapag ang conditions na to ay present, at ang domestic corporation ay nakatanggap ng dividendo mula sa foreign corporation, exempted sa income tax yan. But if any of these requirements are not present, babalik ka sa general rule. Subject ka sa regular corporate income tax. Okay? Okay? 
dati kasi sa NIRC wala automatic basta galing sa foreign corporation regular corporate income tax ka pero ngayon eh pero ngayon ang general rule regular corporate income tax pero pag nasatisfy mo mga requirements na to ang foreign source dividends ay exempted sa income tax okay walang problema kung domestic ang nagdeclare domestic ang nakatanggap automatically exempted yan Okay? Pero kung ang nag-declare ay foreign corporation, nakatanggap domestic corporation, i-apply mo to General rule with the exception. Okay? Klaro tayo dyan ha? Sa inter-corporate dividend. Now, pinag-usapan natin ito kanina. MCIT or minimum corporate income tax. Okay? Minimum corporate income tax or MCIT that is under the NIRC is 2% of the gross income. And you are liable to pay MCIT if you are liable to pay the MCIT if it is higher than the regular corporate income tax. Okay? Dalawang corporations lang naman ang liable sa MCIT. Domestic corporation and resident foreign corporation. Sila ang mga liable sa MCIT. Of course, with exceptions dito sa resident foreign corporation. At alam natin kanina, pinag-usapan natin yung proprietary educational institution, kailan siya magiging liable sa MCIT, kailan siya magiging hindi liable sa MCIT. Okay? 2% yan. 2% of the gross income. But under the CREATE law, okay, again, binabaan yan to 1% of the gross income. But only for a limited period of application. Kailan lang? July 1, 2020 to June 30, 2023, mag-a-apply ang 1%. Pagpatak ng July 1, 2023, balik sa 2% ang MCIT. Okay? Hindi forever yung 1% ng MCIT, ha? Tatlong taon lang. Imaginin mo yung forever 3 years lang. Diba? Kaya pala marami mga naghihiwalay pagkatapos ng ikatlong taon babalik ulit doon sa number 2%. No? So ulitin ko lang nga, pagdating ng July 1, 2023, 2% ulit. Okay? Re remember class, ha? minimum corporate income tax shall be applicable on the fourth taxable year following, okay, following the commencement of the business operation of the corporation. Yun ang rule. Kailan ba mag-a-apply ang MCIT. Ang sabi ng tax code, section 27, letter E, minimum corporate income tax shall be applicable on the fourth taxable year following the commencement of the business operation of the corporation. Marami ang nalilito kung kailan ba mag-uumpisa yung MCIT na yan. Okay? Kaya, ipaliwanag natin yung definition. Okay? Ipaliwanag natin yung definition. On the fourth taxable year following the commencement, you know, siyempre ang starting point mo. Commencement of the operation of the corporation. The question now is, kailan ang commencement ng operation ng corporation? Ang sabi ng revenue regulation, the commencement of operation of the corporation is the year when the corporation is registered with the BIR. Okay? The commencement of the operation is the year when the corporation is registered with the BIR. And from that period, you count 1, 2, 3, 4. And on the fourth taxable year, dyan magiging applicable ang MCIT. Halimbawa, year 2020, year 2011, year 2011, you incorporate a corporation And in the year 2011, you registered it with the BIR. Nirehistro mo sa BIR. So in short, 2011 is the commencement of the operation of the corporation. Kasi nga ang sabi ng revenue regulation, the commencement is the year it is registered with the BIR. So from there, you count four years. 2011, then 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015. Bilang first, second, third, fourth. Dito, 
mag-uumpisang ipataw ang MCIT. Okay? Diyan, sa 2015, mag-uumpisang ipataw ang MCIT because that is the fourth taxable year following the commencement of the operation of the corporation. Because the commencement is the year it is registered with the BIR. So, nirehistro mo 2011 bilang ng apat na taon. 1, 2, 3, 4. Dito, 2015, magiging liable ka na or possible ka na maging liable sa MCIT. Okay? We are clear on that, ha? With respect to MCIT, 2% of the gross income, 1% effective July 1, 2020 until June 30, 2023. Pagpatak ng July 1, 2023, balik sa 2% ang MCIT natin. Okay? Now, focus na tayo sa mga changes under the domestic corporation, ha? Okay? Focus na tayo sa mga changes under the domestic corporation. Okay? Punta na tayo sa resident foreign corporation. Again, resident foreign corporation, sabi ng section 28A, okay? It's a foreign corporation that is organized under the foreign law but is doing business here in the Philippines. And they are taxed in the same manner okay, as a domestic corporation for all income derived from sources within the Philippines. Okay? From sources within the Philippines. Okay? So under the NIRC, the resident foreign corporation is liable to is liable to pay regular corporate income tax of 30% on taxable income. Okay? 30% on taxable income. But under the CREATE law, the resident foreign corporation is now liable to 25% of the taxable income effective July 1, 2020. So from 30%, binabaan to 25%. But mind you, class, ah, mind you, yung 20% regular corporate income tax kapag na-meet mo yung 5 million taxable income at 100 million total asset, hindi yan nag-a-apply sa resident foreign corporation. Only domestic corporation may avail a lower rate of 20%. Okay? Only domestic corporation. Ang resident foreign corporation lowered the rate only from 30 to 25. Ulitin ko lang ha, the 20% lower rate of regular corporate income tax does not apply to resident foreign corporation, but only to a domestic corporation. Okay? Same goes, minimum corporate income tax for resident foreign corporation, ganoon din, 2% gross income under the NIRC. And under the CREATE law, it was lowered to 1% of gross income, but to a limited period only, July 1, 2020, to June 30, 2023. Same, same, same rules yung diniscuss natin kanina. What about other resident foreign corporation on certain passive income? Okay? Interest income from foreign currency deposit under the expanded foreign currency deposit system under the NIRC, the final tax is 10%. But under the CREATE law, it was increased to 15%. Okay? Next is capital gains on shares of stocks not traded in stock exchange. Okay? Uh, hindi ito kasi nabago before ng train law. Uh, you will recall, di ba kapag ka shares of stocks, uh, capital gains from shares of stocks not traded in the local stock exchange. The old rule. The old, old rule. Okay? Uh, 5%, 10%, 5%. For the first 100,000 and 10% in excess of 100,000. That's the old rule. Okay, that's the old rule. Under the train law, it was changed to flat rate of 15% on net capital gains. But the train law, the train law only amended the rules for resident citizen, non-resident citizen, resident alien, non resident alien engage in trade and not engage in trade and domestic corporation. Diyan lamang ang nabago ng train law. Ulitin ko ha, dati 5%, 10% yung rule. Ginawang 15% on net capital gains ng train law. But this 15% is applicable only to these taxpayers, resident citizen, non-resident citizen, resident alien, and non-resident alien. Hindi na kasama sa train law yung resident foreign corporation and non-resident foreign corporation. Ngayon, ang ginawa ng CREATE law, pinagpare-pareho na sila. So, 
Under the NIRC, 5% for the first 100,000, 10% in excess of 100,000. Now, under the CREATE law, flat rate of 15% will apply on the net capital gain. So lahat sila, kahit sinong taxpayer, individual or corporation, resident citizen, alien, and resident alien, resident corporation, resident foreign corporation, kahit sino. Kahit sino sa kanila mga taxpayer, iisa na ang rule sa kanila with respect to capital gains from sale of shares of stocks not traded in local stock exchange. Ano ngayon ang rule nila? 15% on the net capital gain. Okay? A resident foreign corporation, walang change na na-introduce with respect to intercorporate dividend hmm? under the NIRC. If the declaring corporation is a domestic corporation and the dividend is received by a resident foreign corporation, the liability, the, 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 the resident foreign corporation is exempted. Okay? But kapag ang nag-declare ay resident foreign corporation or non-resident foreign corporation, the rule is regular corporate income tax or exempt depending on whether the income is derived from sources within the Philippines or sources outside the Philippines. Okay? If the dividend is derived from sources within the Philippines, then subject ka sa regular corporate income tax. If the dividends are derived from sources outside the Philippines, then that dividend is not subject to income tax. How are we going to know whether the dividend is derived from sources within the Philippines or sources from outside the Philippines? You check section 42, letter A, number 2. Okay, yan ang situs of income taxation. It will tell us when is the dividend derived from sources within and sources without the Philippines. Section 42, letter A, number 2. Okay, dividends. Okay. What about other resident foreign corporation like the regional or area headquarters? No, there is no change with respect to regional or area headquarters or yung tinatawag natin na RHQ. They remain to be not subject to income tax. Huh? RHQ remains to be exempt from the income tax and no changes introduced by CREATE law. Ang merong binago, ang CREATE law, is a ROHQ, which is Regional Operating Head quarters. Okay? Regional operating headquarters. Okay? Previously, under the NIRC, regional operating headquarters are liable to pay 10% on their taxable income. But effective January 1, 2022, yeah, another na naman, iba na namang period, ang, ang effectivity, the regional operating headquarters are now liable to 25%. Regular corporate income tax. Bakit 25%? A resident foreign corporation yan eh. Di ba ang resident foreign corporation from 30% ibinaba to 25%? Right? Pwede ba sila mag-avail ng 20% regular corporate income tax? No. Because the 20% is available only to domestic corporation. Okay? Sa domestic corporation lang yan. A resident foreign corporation to. Okay? So at present, 2021, nasa 10% pa taxable income, ang ROHQ. But effective January 1, 2022, ah, 25% na ang babayaran nila. Another thing, offshore banking unit, OBU. Under the NIRC, subject yan sa 10%. Under the NIRC, but upon the effectivity of the CREATE law, 25% na ang babayaran nila. Effective kailan? April 11. 2021. Okay? Effective April 11, 2021. Offshore banking units are now subject to 25% regular corporate income tax. Kailan? April 11, 2021. Pero ang ROHQ, ha? ROHQ ay January 1, 2022. Kaya nga sinasabi ko sa inyo, class, madaling tandaan yung mga rates. Madaling tandaan yung mga rates kung ano ang nagbago from 30, naging 25, naging 20. Ang mga nakakagulo ay yung effectivity dates. Kasi mayroon sa kanila iba't iba ang effectivity dates. Okay? Kaya yan ang tatandaan nyo, yung mga effectivity dates natin. Ulitin ko lang ha, paano malalaman yung effectivity date? Tingnan ang provision ng, ng, ang provision ng CREATE law. Nagbigay ba siya ng effectivity date? Kung ang sagot, oo, sundin mo ang effectivity date na yan. July 1 ba yan, 2020? 
January 1 ba yan, 2022? O limited period lang ang application, sundin mo ang period na yon. Pero kung hindi nag-provide ang provision ng effectivity date, kagaya sa OBU, tanggal na lang yan. Create law. Okay? E di ang general effectivity, rate ng, na effectivity date ng create law mag apply April 11, 2021. Okay? Now, a non-resident foreign corporation, ha? 30% gross income, okay? ang mag apply sa kanya. Di ba, ang, ang rule natin dyan, gross income less allowable deduction is equal to taxable income. Kung domestic corporation niya at resident foreign, dito mo imumultiply yung regular corporate income tax mo to arrive at the liability. Tama? Pero kung non-resident foreign corporation, the gross income tax of 30%, eh dito mo lang minumultiply is equal to the gross income tax. Kaya nga, if a taxpayer is subject to gross income tax, they cannot avail the benefit of a deduction. Walang deductions allowed if you are subject to gross income tax. Kasi nga, direct multiplication lang yan to your gross income. And there are only two taxpayers in the Philippines which are subject to gross income tax. Ano yun? Non-resident foreign corporation and non-resident alien not engaged in trade or business. Pareho na silang 25%. Under the CREATE law, non-resident foreign corporation is subject to gross income tax. No, not anymore at 30%, but at a rate of 25%. Binabaan na naman. Ginawang 20%. Ano na naman yung pampagulo dyan? Effectivity date. January 1, 2021. Okay? January 1, 2021. Para din nag-retro. Di ba ang create law ay naging effective April 11, 2021? Ito nag-retro. Bumalik ng January 1, 2020. So, tatandaan natin na mga effectivity dates na yan na. Dyan, dyan, dyan magkakaroon ng difference na. Dyan, dyan magkakaroon ng katalo sa effectivity dates. Madaling tandaan ng mga rates eh. Di ba? From 30, ginawang 25, ginawang 20. Ang resident foreign, ang non-resident foreign, parehong 25%. Only domestic ang pwede mag-avail ng 20%. Pero ang kaibahan ay ang kanilang effectivity dates. Ang kanilang effectivity But on certain income, okay, for intercorp dividend, di ba we have 15% subject to tax pairing rule. But upon the effectivity of create law, July 1, 2020, the credit is the difference between the regular corporate income tax and 15%. Okay, for capital gains on shares of stocks not traded, as I told you earlier, pinag pare-pareho na sila, pare-pareho na ang rule natin. Flat rate of 15% on net capital gain. For all taxpayers now. For capital gains from sale of shares of stocks not traded in stock exchange, flat rate of 15% will now apply. Okay? What about improperly accumulated earning stocks? Okay, some sort of good news. This improperly accumulated earning stocks shall no longer be imposed upon the effectivity of train law. Kailan ba nag-take effect ang train law? April 11, 2021. Okay? So, if April 11, 2021, wala na po tayong improperly accumulated earning stock. So, yung section 29 of the tax code is now repealed. Repealed na yan. Okay? But, for, for taxpayers na nag-end ang kanyang taxable year before, okay? Before the effectivity of the train law, okay, uh, this is not after, uh, let me correct this, this is before. Ah, no, no. Sorry, sorry. This statement pala pertaining dito sa taas. This, ito yung, yung, yung non-imposition. This shall apply to entire taxable year ending after the create law. So kung ang taxable year ng taxpayer ay nag-end bago mag-take effect ang create law, liable ka pa sa improperly accumulated earnings tax. Kailan ba nag-take effect ang train law? Ang ang create April 11, 2021. Eh, ang fiscal year mo ending March 31. O, hindi ka pa sakop. Hindi ka pa sakop dyan. Pwede ka pang patawan ng improperly accumulated earnings. Okay? Kaya lang, class. Look, even if the CREATE law repealed Section 29 of the tax code, 
with respect to the imposition of improperly accumulated earnings tax, there is a provision under the revised corporation code which still imposes penalty if you hold or retain surplus profit in excess of 100% of your paid up capital. You will recall in section 43 of the corporation code or section 42 now under the revised corporation code, corporations are prohibited from retaining surplus profits of more than 100, exceeding 100% of their paid up capital under section 42 of the revised corporation code. Hindi ka pa rin pinapayagan ng corporation code mag-retain ng surplus profits, ng retained earnings in excess of the 100% of your paid up capital. But there are certain exceptions to the rule. Number one, if the uh, retention of surplus profit is pursuant to a legitimate business expansion. Number two, if it is pursuant to a loan covenant or to a loan agreement that you are prohibited from distribution of distributing surplus profit. And number three, in, in pursuance to uh, a legitimate business activity. No, yun yung mga exceptions natin. Kung kailan pinapayagan ka. Kaya lang class, maliit lang naman ang penalty na iniimpose ng SEC. 10,000 lang kapag lumampas ka doon sa sa paid up capital no mas malaki pa rin yung improperly accumulated no kaya lang sometimes no kailangan din nating tahiin yung batas no kasi itong improperly accumulated you are retaining profits more than what you reasonably need you are being imposed of 10% tax on improperly accumulated earnings and yet dito sa corporation code section 42 of the revised corporation code pinagbabawalan ka pa rin okay na na mag, mag hold ng uh, surplus profits so sa tax aspect Ligtas ka na. Pero doon sa corporate side, sa SEC, pwede ka pa rin patawan ng, ng penalty. Not tax, ha? not tax, but penalty only. Okay? But as far as we are concerned, for tax purposes, Section 29 is now repealed. Improperly accumulated earnings tax shall no longer be imposed upon the effectivity of the CREATE law on April 11, 2021. Some changes on the allowable deductions. Now we have additional uh, allowable deduction for expenses. Uh, ito yung mga labor expenses na incurred to train yung mga students natin sa public senior high school. Di ba yung mga nag-OOJT, alimbawa? But that must be covered by an apprentice agreement under the labor code. And there must be a certification issued by the DepEd, CHED, or TESDA. Okay? But the deduction that you can claim shall not exceed 10% of the direct labor wage. So it will encourage uh, it will encourage companies to accept yung mga OJT, mga intern. No? But may requirement tayo, dapat covered ka ng apprenticeship agreement under the labor code. And the total deductions that you can claim for the value of the labor training expenses should not exceed 10% of your total direct labor wage okay another change the allowable deduction is on the interest no uh, change in the tax arbitrage rule or the interest arbitrage rule okay ano ba tong uh, interest arbitrage rule na to diba interest expense is an allowable deduction okay interest expense is an allowable deduction provided you comply with the requirements and what are the requirements, okay, what are the requirements dito to, to claim interest expense? Number one, uh, the, inter, the indebtedness must be the debt of the taxpayer. Hindi yan dapat utang ng ibang tao. The indebtedness must be related to the business or exercise of a profession. The interest must be stipulated in writing. The interest must be legally due. It must be incurred or accrued. On, on the year uh, when it is being claimed. Uh, the interest must not arise from related party transaction under Section 34 and under Section 33. So yung mga loans between family members, no, di mo pwedeng i-claim ang interest expense as an allowable deduction. Uh, the loan where the interest is incurred must not be used to finance uh, uh, petroleum projects okay? or petroleum activities. And uh, the interest must be subject to the interest arbitrage rule. Anong ibig sabihin ng interest arbitrage rule? The interest expense that you can claim 
shall be reduced by a certain percentage of the interest income that you earned. Di ba? Yung interest expense na pwede mong i-claim ay babawasan okay, ng certain percentage ng interest income na yung in -earn. And that amount is what? Here, 33% of the interest income subject to final tax. Okay, halimbawa, halimbawa, meron kang interest expense. You have interest expense of 100,000. Tapos meron kang interest income, let's say, uh, 30,000. Okay? So for purposes of computing the allowable deduction, how much interest expense can you claim? Okay? So yung 100,000, meron ka ditong interest expense. Kasi dito, the taxpayer's allowable deduction for interest expense is reduced by 33% of the interest income. 33% of the interest income. 33% of this. 33% of 30,000. So what is that? One third, di ba? So 10,000. So you can only claim interest expense of 90,000. Yan ang arbitrage rule. The interest expense shall be reduced by 33% of the interest income. Take note, 33% of the interest income. Not 33% of the interest expense. Okay? Kung wala kang interest income, eh di wala kang pagbabasan. Wala kang pagbabasan. Okay? Ano ba ang konsepto ng arbitrage rule? Okay? Let me try briefly explain to you bakit may tax arbitrage rule. Okay? Halimbawa, nag-borrow nag, nag ka ng, nag, ng money from the bank sa halagang 1 million pesos. You borrowed money from the bank in the amount of 1 million pesos. And this is subject to 10% interest. So at the end of the year, at the end of the year, you will pay 100,000 interest expense. Tama? Umutang ka ng 1 million, pinatawang ka ng 10% interest, bayad ka, 100,000 interest expense. Okay? Now, anong ginawa mo dito sa loan? i-deposito mo sa banko mo. You deposited the loan to your bank. And since this is a deposit to your bank, halimbawa, nag-earn ka dito ng 10% interest income. Yung loan mo na 1 million, i-deposito mo sa kabilang banko at nag-earn ng 10% interest income. At the end of one year, meron kang 100,000 interest income. Okay? Interest income. The interest expense is an allowable deduction, while the interest income is subject to a final income tax of 20%. Tama? So, yung 100,000, yung 100,000 interest income, multiplied by 20%, magbabayad ka ng final income tax of 20%. You will pay final income tax of 20% on the 100% income. Okay? Now, balik tayo dito sa interest expense. Ano ang pwede mong gawin dito sa interest expense na to? Anong pwede mong gawin? You can claim it as an allowable deduction. You can claim it as an allowable deduction. And if you claim 100,000 interest expense, your taxable income will be lower by 100,000. Tama? If you claim 100,000 interest expense, your taxable income will be lower by 100,000. And if you multiply that 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 amount to 30%, why 30%? Because that is the old corporate income tax, okay? You have a tax benefit of 30,000. You have a tax benefit of 30,000. Nakatipid ka sa regular corporate income tax ng 30,000. Okay? Bakit? Example, ha? Example. Ang taxable income mo without interest is 200,000. The taxable income without interest. Pag multiply mo to ng 30%, ang regular corporate income tax liability mo 60,000. Tama? Pero kapag yung taxable income mo inapply mo yung interest expense mo na 100,000, 200 minus 100, eh di ba 100 na lang ang taxable income mo? Pag multiply mo yan ng 30%, magkano ang regular corporate income tax mo? 
30,000. Tama? Right? Nakatipid ka pa sa income tax because you claim interest expense. You're able to derive benefit doon sa interest expense. Magkano? 30,000 ang natipid mo. 30,000 ang natipid mo. Nakuha natin? Nagka-tax benefit ka ng 30,000. Pero class, tingnan mo, isang loan lang ang pinag-uusapan natin dyan. Isang loan lang. Doon sa 1 million loan, doon sa 1 million loan, okay, nagbayad ka ng 100,000 inter interest, nag-benefit ka ng 30,000. Diniposito mo sa banko, kumita ka ng 100,000, nagbayad ka ng 20,000 na interest income. Tingnan mo ha, nakinabang ka ng 30%, nakinabang ka ng 30,000, pero ang naibayad mo lang sa gobyerno ay 20,000 doon sa interest income. Makano ang difference niyan? 10,000. There is a net benefit on your part of 10,000. Kaya ang ginawa dyan, 10,000 divided by 30 is equal to 33%. This is the amount of the tax arbitrage. Yan, kaya lumabas yung 33% because of this. Huh? Because of that. Okay, para ma-recover naman ng gobyerno yung 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 lugi niya sa transaction na to. Sabi ng gobyerno o oh, yung interest expense na i-claim mo as an allowable deduction, babawasan natin yan ng 33% ng interest income ha. Okay? That's the rule. Yan ang background ng tax arbitrage rule. Okay? And now, under the create law The, the, the interest arbitrage rule is reduced from 30 to 33% now to 20%. From 33% to 20%. Okay? So, kung meron kang interest expense, let me erase this. If you have an interest expense of 100,000 and you have an interest income of uh, 50,000. Okay? Magkano ng interest expense ang pwede mong ang pwede mong i-claim as an allowable deduction, di ba? Yung interest income, this will be multiplied by 20% or at uh, 10,000. So, 100,000 minus 10,000, you can only claim 90,000 as your allowable deduction interest expense. Okay? So, hindi naman tayo papakomputin sa bar. Hindi tayo papakomputin sa bar. But at least, alam natin ang konsepto ng tax arbitrage rule. But if the domestic corporation is qualified to avail the 20% regular corporate income tax, zero ang deduction niya. Zero. Okay. Ibig sabihin, qualified sa 20% yung domestic corporation interest expense buong 100,000 ang pwede niyang i-claim as an interest expense walang ibabawas because nga the arbitrage rule not as us that the rate is now zero okay originally ha, the NIRC 33% ang interest arbitrage rule it was lowered to 20% but uh, but if the domestic corporation is qualified to avail 20%, then zero ang deduction sa kanya. Okay? Let's go to section 40. The changes under section 40. This is the tax-free uh, exchange. Okay? The general rule is that the gain or loss, uh, no gain or loss shall be recognized if the corporation is a party to a reorganization. Okay? Any income, any gain or loss arising from the exchange of property, securities, or shares in a reorganization that is not subject to income tax kasi nga tax free exchange siya. How do we define reorganization? Here it is. It's quite technical. So I suggest you you read this in the original text uh, uh, under the the create law on what does it mean on what uh, reorganization mean. Okay? In addition class no for tax free uh, uh, exchange no There is also no gain or loss shall be recognized if the property is transferred to a corporation if alone or together with others not exceeding four, they are able to gain control okay, from that corporation. Okay? 
And how do you define control? So control means ownership in a small corporation, okay, after the transfer of the property possessing at least 51% of the total voting power of all classes of stocks entitled to vote, okay? And control is also measured uh, collectively, not individually of all classes of stock entitled to vote by the transfer of. Ang pinakamaganda nito class na naging inintroduce dito sa tax free exchange ng create law is that hindi mo na kailangan ng prior BIR ruling okay, for purposes of availing the tax exemptions under the uh, under the create law. Noon kasi if you are under if you will uh, enter into a merger or acquisition resulting to a tax free exchange of stocks or properties kailangan mo pa ng confirmatory ruling sa BIR na hindi ka subject sa income tax hindi ka subject sa VAT hindi ka subject sa GST okay kailan ang tagal medyo matagal noon talagang inaabot minsan ng years bago ka maka-secure ng confirmatory ruling that you are exempted sa income tax and sa value added tax but now no under the create law hindi mo na kailangan ng BIR ruling okay uh, for purposes of of uh, availing the tax exemption under Section 40C of the tax code or yung tax-free exchange natin. Okay? So, those are the changes to income tax. Let us go to the changes on value-added tax under the CREATE law. Ano yung mga changes natin dito? Well, ito, una yung mga recall mo sa Section 109, yung tax exempt natin. Dito kasi yung mga real properties not held for sale or held for lease in the ordinary course of business or yung mga utilize for low cost and socialized housing. Originally kasi ang rate nito 1.5 million for residential lot and for house and lot 2.5 million. Yan ang nasa yan ang nasa code natin, yan ang nasa train law. Ang ginawa ng create law in increase yung threshold. Okay, take note ha, applicable lang ito sa real properties not held for sale or not intended for lease or yung mga new utilized for low cost housing dati ang rate niyan 1.5 million 2.5 million ang ginawa ng create law tinaas for residential lot from 1.5 million the threshold is now 2.5 million to be exempt sa value added tax and for residential house and lot the old rate the old threshold of 2.5 million is now increased to 4.2 million. Kaya lang class, this provision was vetoed by the president. So ibig sabihin, balik tayo sa old rate. Ano yung old rate? 1.5 million and 2.5 million. Okay? Na veto ng presidente yan. Okay? Now, because nga naman, uh, masyadong kwan eh, masyadong madidistart, no? may malaking mawawalang income sa government and at the same time ang daling dayain eh, eh baba pag uh, tawag dito uh, hindi magdaling dayain kundi madaling i-evade yung payment ng tax kundi pag paghati-hatiin mo lang yung mga lote ibenta mo nang hindi ka lalang pa sa amount na to di ba na evade mo na ang payment ng VAT kaya ang sabi doon ibalik natin dito okay ibalik natin sa 1.5 ibalik natin sa 2.5 okay another thing ah yung sale importation print or publication of books a newspaper and magazine, dinagdagan under the CREATE law, isinama yung journal and for such educational reading material covered by the UNESCO agreement on the importation of educational, scientific, and cultural materials including digital or electronic copy. Dinagdagan lang ng items na exempted. Okay? Provided the materials enumerated are not devoted principally to publication of paid advertisement. Kaya lang class, inanggal yung requirement na to. Natanggal na yung requirement na which appears on regular interval with fixed prices for subscription. Nawala sa create lo yung requirement na yan. Di ba dapat regular yung interval, yung books, yung journal, yung magazine. Dapat regular yung publication. Halimbawa, everyday ba yan? Weekly ba yan? Monthly ba yan? Quarterly ba yan? Semi-annually ba yan? Or annually ba yan? Okay. It appears on regular interval. It, it has fixed prices It for subscription. Nawala yung requirement na yun. Ngayon, ang requirement na lang is provided the journals, the newspaper, the books are not 
principally devoted for paid advertisement. Okay? Yun na lang ang requirement na yun. Okay? Uh, as I told you, no, may mga medicines tayo and drugs na idinagdag which are exempted sa value-added tax like drugs and medicine for diabetes, high cholesterol, hypertension, beginning January 1, 2020, and uh, drugs and medicine for cancer, mental illness, tuberculosis, and kidney diseases beginning January 1, 2021. So pareho ng effective ito na hindi subject sa bat ang mga gamot para sa mga uh, condition na to, para sa mga medical condition na yan. Diabetes, high cholesterol, hypertension, cancer, mental illness, tuberculosis, and kidney disease. But exempt yan. Pag bumili ka sa mercury drugs, dapat hindi yan papatawan ng uh, 12% VAT. No? Another thing, no, because of the pandemic, no, the sale or importation of the following from January 1, 2021 to December 31, 2023, I exempt. No? Like capital equipment, spare parts for the production of protective equipment. So pag namili ka ng mga machineries, mga spare parts, para dito sa Pilipinas, magmamanufacture ka ng mga surgical cups, mga mask, scrub suit, goggles, and face shield. Yan. Yung, yung pag-import mo, not subject sa VAT yan. O kaya lahat ng drugs, vaccine, medical services, specifically prescribed and directly related for the treatment of COVID-19, but exempt din natin yan. And drugs for treatment of COVID-19 as approved by FDA, but exempt din yan. Okay? Ito may kinalaman ko saan? Sa uh, response natin sa pandemic. No? Hindi napapatawa ng VAT yung mga importation na uh, may kinalaman sa response to the pandemic. Okay? So, for tax uh, exempt persons, di ba ang rule natin dyan? For persons that are not subject to VAT, they will be subject to value, uh, they will be subject to other percentage tax at a rate of 3% under section 116 of the tax code. So, yung OPT natin ay 3% for those not subject uh, those who are exempt sa value added tax. But for a limited period of time from July 1, 2020 until June 30, 2023, the rate of 3% will go down to 1%. And again, pagpatak ng July 1, 2023, balik ka ulit sa 3%. Okay? So class, no? In section 204C of the tax code and in section 229, of the tax code, no? Uh, andun yung rule natin with respect to refund. If you claim, uh, if you file a claim for credit or refund of tax illegally or erroneously paid or collected, di ba, you have a period of two years to file a claim for refund, okay? And within a period of two years, the administrative and judicial claim should should uh, should happen within that period of two years under the CREATE law, dinagdagan. Ang sabi doon sa CREATE law, the commissioner has a period of 90 days to decide your claim for refund. Okay? Has a period of 90 days to decide to your claim for refund, whether to grant or deny the claim for refund. Okay? Nilagyan na ng time period. Under the NIRC kasi, walang period to decide. Ikaw na taxpayer, ang babantayan mo, dapat hindi lumampas ng two years. Dapat within two years, makaakyat ka na sa Court of Appeal, Court of Tax Appeals kung hindi pa naaaprubahan yung application mo. Okay? Pero sa CREATE, dinagdagan nila ng period. Ang DIR daw dapat maka-decide within 90 days. Okay? Kaya lang class, that was vetoed by the President. Under, uh, for what reason? Because it violates the principle of sound tax system. What principle? Okay? The principle of administrative feasibility. You will recall, we have fiscal adequacy, administrative feasibility, and theoretical justice as principles of uh, as as principles of sound tax system. Ang sabi ng presidente, ang paglalagay ng 90% is not administratively feasible because it is too short to evaluate the application. And because of that period, maaaring i-approve na lang okay, without the complete audit ng BIR or i-deny without the benefit of, again, an audit on, in favor of the taxpayer. 
So sabi ng presidente, mukhang hindi yan administratively feasible. Sa daming ginagawa ng mga BIR officers natin, lalagyan pa natin ng time frame na 90 days. Okay? It, it, it will be too much burden for them na to the detriment of the taxpayer din. Kasi kung mag expire na nga naman yung 90 days, baka i-deny lang ng i-deny ang claim natin for refund. So, vetoed na yan. So, balik tayo sa original rule. Walang period ang BIR to decide. Okay? Your claim for refund under Section 204C or Section 229. Ikaw lang, ang, ang watch out mo lang ay dapat hindi mag-expire yung two years. Kung nag-file ka within the period of two years and there is no decision yet, and the two-year period is about to expire, wala pang decision ng BIR, umakyat ka na sa Court of Tax Appeals. You elevate it already to the Court of Tax Appeals. Otherwise, if you wait for the two-year period to expire, Without okay, going to the Court of Tax Appeals, then your judicial remedy is now prescribed. Okay? Your judicial remedy is now prescribed. Okay? So that's all for the changes in the train law. And let's, let's have a, 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 a brief discussion on Title 13. This is, the new, uh, this is the new chapter title under the tax code added by the CREATE law, specifically for tax. Uh, incentives. No? Uh, the goal of the government is to grant tax incentives or to have a tax incentive scheme that is performance based, that is targeted, that is time bound, and that is transparent. Okay? Uh, the coverage of Title 13 shall apply to all existing investment promotion agencies. Okay? Uh, the investment promotion agency shall maintain their powers under the special law except as modified by the CREATE law, but the Department of Finance, the Bureau of Internal Revenue, and the Bureau of Customs shall maintain their respective mandates and powers. Ang, ang concept kasi nito, class, is to rationalize yung pagbibigay ng tax incentives sa mga businesses. And the tax incentive shall only be granted to registered businesses and registered projects and activities. At sino ang nag sino nagbibigay ng incentives? Noon, yung mga IPAs, mga investment promotion agencies. But now, we have we have 13 investment promotion agencies, ganyan karami ang nagbibigay ng mga tax incentives to different entities. Okay? But under the CREATE law, there is a there is an entity or a body created known as the Fiscal Incentive Review Board, which will have an oversight function over all tax incentives. And the FIRB shall be chaired by, uh, by the Department of Finance. So, yung mga IPAs, yung mga investment promotion activities, ah, sorry, investment promotion agencies, there will now be a mother board. There will now be a mother umbrella that will have an oversight function over all the grant of tax incentives. And that is the Fiscal Incentive Review Board. Okay? So the authority to grant the tax incentive shall now be at the Fiscal Incentives Review Board or the IPA as delegated by the FIRB. So pwede pa rin ang mga investment promotion activities to grant tax incentives provided it is delegated by the FIRB. Okay? So, ano-ano ba yung mga tax duty incentives under the CREATE law? We have, excuse me, we have five. Okay? We have five tax and duty incentives. Number one is income tax holiday. Number two, special corporate income tax. Number three, enhanced deductions. Number four, duty exemption on importation of capital equipment, raw materials, spare parts, or accessories. And number five, VAT exemption on importation and VAT zero rating on local purchases. So, yan yung mga incentives na pwede natin i-grant sa mga registered business activity and registered uh, enterprises. Okay? But specifically, for special corporate income tax, no? it is applicable to export enterprises, domestic market enterprises, with minimum investment capital of 500 million or do sa mga domestic market enterprises classified as critical and they can avail the 5% gross income tax in lieu 
of the national and local taxes. So yan ang SCIT. Yan ang special corporate income tax. 5% gross income tax in lieu of national and local taxes. So these are your enhanced deductions. One of the incentives na pwedeng ibigay. Your depreciation allowance, additional depreciation allowance of 10% for building, 20% for machineries. Additional deduction, 100% for research and development, 100% for training, 50% for power expense, 50% for labor, 50% for domestic input expense, and 50% for reinvestment. Yung NOL ko, usually three years natin pwedeng spread, pero dito pinapayagan ka for over five years. Okay? Uh, period of availment, you can see here, these are the, per uh, the period na pwede mong i-avail yung mga tax incentives natin. It would depend on what kind of registered enterprise you are. Okay? So for export enterprise and domestic market enterprise, engage in critical activities. Your income tax holiday is four to seven years, depending on the location and industry. Uh, the special corporate income tax or enhanced deduction after the expiration of four to seven years for a period of 10 years. And domestic market enterprise under SIPP not classified as critical, ITH four to seven years, and SCIT or enhanced deduction for five years. Magkasunod yun na four to five years income tax holiday ka, then pagkatapos nun, 10 years na susunod na special corporate income tax or enhanced deduction, depending kung ano ay ipagkakaloob sa'yo. Okay? Kailan mag-uumpisa? Period of availment from the Actual start of commercial operation with the registered business enterprises, but which should be within three years from the date of registration, unless otherwise provided under the SIP. So, when qualified expansion or a new project, pwede din dyan. Existing registered enterprises may also qualify for incentives under the CREATE law. Okay, so, yan yung mga uh, inintroduce, no? Basically, very basic, uh, no? Uh, pasad pinasadahan lang natin yan. We cannot discuss that in detail due, due to limited time. And some of the items dyan sa tax incentive ay yung function ng FIRB. No? I suggest you read the Title 3 of, of the tax code no? as provided by CREATE law, especially those if you are in, in, in uh, uh, enterprises under the Strategic Investment Priority uh, Plan. Okay? So that is a, a brief discussion of the uh, Eight law, the changes that uh, we need to, to understand or at least to know. Okay, so before I end my uh, discussion, uh, again, I'm inviting you to uh, avail my books still available at Rex Bookstore, uh, Volume One and uh, Volume uh, Two no? for your bar exam this 2021. Okay.